Green and Green, it was the projects. Affordable housing that had a particularly bad reputation. You would never know. Translation, when people built a ghetto and then erased it when they realized they built a ghetto. Ooh, no offense. non -tated. I like going like into the mirror. Yeah, 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 into the mirror is so good. Like, he's really selling it. He's going to blow. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, he was literally like, I summoned Candyman. And I'm like, no. Candyman ain't real. And something leaves a stain. Even if you think you washed it out, it's still there. You can feel it, man. A thinning deep in the fabric. This neighborhood got caught in a loop. The original Candyman, um, uh, directed, written directed by Bernard Rose, uh, based on a story by Clive Barker, um, was is one of m m uh, my favorites. It's a very in influential movie for me, um, mainly because uh, I believe it came out in 1992, uh, so I would have been like 13, and uh, this was I was a horror fan, and we didn't have a Black Freddy. We didn't have a black Jason. We loved, we identified with Freddie and Jason, but when Candyman came along, it felt very, um, it felt very daring, um, and it felt very uh, cathartic, um, and it was terrifying. Um, so, th this was one of the movies that told me we we can um, that that black people can <laughs> be in horror. Um, even though there, there, there are, uh, you know, many examples of black people in horror movies. This was, this was one for me that felt particularly badass. The original film, Helen is a bit, bit of the, you know, played expertly by Virginia Madsen, by the way. Um, Helen Lyle is a bit of a fish out of water, <laughs> to say the least, in the Cabrini Green area. And a lot, a lot is focused on her fear, and 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 therefore our the audience's fear of this space, of this black space. Um, well, that's that 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 um, Cabrini Green has been torn down, and it's and it's fairly gentrified now. And the story that felt resonated to me to me uh, now is the the story of. of my fear of the white space and, 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 
and to be able to explore the quote unquote mirror image or the flip of the first one um, to me was a point that made uh, the project worthy in itself to see the the full uh, realization of that the conversation that this movie is. Candyman is an eternal figure, and uh, what what we did with this this version of it and this telling of it was we we focused on the connection. We 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 tried to bring out the connection with the the fact that this this is an, is an epidemic of violence on black bodies in this country, and you know Candyman. Um, can't can't uh, be can't just be singular. He, he's a concept. He's a story. He's a boogeyman, and that means he applies across the boundaries of time. Um, he's eternal. In the beginning of the film, you know, Anthony is and he's an artist who's maybe had a little bit of success, but. That success is in danger of fading, and um, you know, much like the Candyman ghost, his ambition lies in becoming eternal, in, in fame and success. Um, and that ends up being his his, his tragic flaw. But um, you know, he's also he's also a character that has a deep trauma in his past. That he's been trying to work out uh, through his art, and so that's you know part of part of his journey is getting to his his own truths, um, you know, at, at the while he thinks he's um, pursuing fame. I had worked with Yaya on us briefly, so you know, I told I told uh, you know all I did was tell Nia how how much I wanted to work with him again. Um, she went and, and met with him and they hit it off uh, famously. Um, so, you know, I was, I was, I was happy to I endorse, but the, 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 the film was, you know, she, she really um, saw him as the guy um, and, uh, and it was music to my ears. He is, he, he, he has a bit of a chameleon ability and at the same time he's a, uh, He's a total, uh, he has a star quality and a singularness at the same time. But, um, you know, he, he's one of those guys that can hit notes that you're not expecting and nuanced notes that you didn't see coming. I think what Nia has really done is she's explored race on all these, all these, all the levels from the uncomfortable to the downright um, devastating. Um, and she's, you know, she's kept a, a love story, uh, in there at the center, a tragic love story at the center, um, like the original as well. The story of Candyman is so perennial, and that's part of the reason why it's exciting to tell it at any time period, um, from the origin of the story itself within, in the context of, of the first film, you know, in the 1890s uh, to now. What we're talking about, I think, is the cycles of violence and how history repeats itself and how we collectively grieve and collectively process trauma, which is through stories. So I think it's, it's always a, a time to tell a story like Candyman, which is, you know, the, kind of the big tragedy of, of the tale in the first place. Candyman was just like a real sort of urban legend when I was growing up. It wasn't necessarily just attached to the movie. It felt very present. Um, you know, I went to school like, right next to the projects. I lived across the street from the projects. And so um, for us, Candyman was just hanging out over, you know, across the street from us. Um, and so I think the first time I saw it was in elementary school. Um, but this was after I'd already kind of lived with the idea of, of <laughs> there being some demon ghost man killing people in the projects. So, um, uh, I, I think my first time seeing the movie was like terrifying as it is for most people, but I'd already kind of had this lore in my head. So it was kind of like connecting the dots. I was like, oh, that's Candyman. I see, I get it. I basically looked to history and, and there are stories that I already knew, stories that I found as I was doing research um, that I wanted to 
take inspiration from. I didn't want to like take these people's lives and say these are they're part of the Candyman lore, but just to be inspired by things that had actually happened um, and that related to our um, to our story. Um, and really, it was because I wanted to show how prevalent, common um, these horrific events are, and and how they're just you know this is a straight line from Danny Robitaille to Anthony and all the people in between. So for me, it was really necessary to to take inspiration from real life, but also not um, co-opt a story and like put it in, into our narrative. Um, so I think that was also a, a, a balance uh, to strike. When we meet Anthony at the beginning of the film, he's an artist, um, you know, he has a great girlfriend, he's living, he just moved in uh, to this great apartment, um, sort of part of a part of this wave of gentrification in the Cabrini Green neighborhood. Um, and he has had, sort of a creative block for, for two years. He hasn't really been able to create. And part of that is because he's, he's grappling with his identity, not just as a person, um, but as, some, like as an artist working in a very white industry, as, as someone who is trying to contend with their, their past. Um, and in the context of the film, as someone who has to uh, contend with like supernatural entities. Um, so the film sees him kind of go on this journey of self-actualization, uh, sort of a coming of age, but with the added weight of this history that he uncovers. We had two artists do Anthony's work because we really wanted to show his, his early work um, and then the work that he makes in the film and how, how different he is and how he's being changed, not only through his own like, search and journey, but also maybe by demon ghost uh, <laughs> murderers, um, yeah. How do you maintain tension when you know as soon as you say a fifth Candyman, the people who said it are gonna die. Like, how do you prolong that? How do you make that exciting to watch every time it happens? Um, also, how do you like make someone saying Candyman five times like interesting every time it happens in the movie? <laughs> um, so it was really fun to kind of figure out different ways to, to, um, to, to do them and also different, different scenarios and different people would happen to and different ways that they say Candyman five times. And, um, and from, like a, from a practical like workflow point of view, like we did a lot of previs, um, in particular because mirrors were so um, important obviously to the movie and so trying to figure out like how to shoot the reflection of a reflection where, you know, in space like Candyman would be and all that stuff was really complicated so previs was, was really, um, really, really helpful. Um, and then on the day it was really about like putting all the parts together and then like the actors like having fun um, <laughs> with their gruesome deaths. With Candyman, with with talking about unwilling martyrs, I wanted to make sure that, in in the rush to sort of process our, what happened and to and to to choose a side and to create um, sense of something horrifying, that we don't forget the the life of the person who who um, who was harmed, who was who was killed. Um, because a martyr is a powerful symbol, a monster is a powerful symbol, but at the end of the day, like if, if the name isn't remembered, then then, then what then what are we we're really talking about? Because um, the name, the person, the life that was lost, that's the most important thing. And so, you know, in Candyman, it's say his name, say his name, say his name. People say Candyman, um, but they don't say they don't say the name of Dan Robitaille or or Anthony McCoy. And so that was commentary on that um, as well. And, and, and also on like what, what's happening in the movement now, which is so powerful, which is like, say the name of the person, say Breonna Taylor, say Jacob Blake, you know, um, which I think is really powerful and really important and, um, and what I wanted to, to talk more about in, in relation to Candyman, um, which is that he's not a monster, he's not a martyr, he's, he's Danny Robitaille, a painter who, who lost his life, or he's Anthony McCoy, um, a painter, um, and awkward dude who, who lost his life, you know. Um, I want to talk about humanity. Well, I hope the audiences get you know wrapped up in the story. I hope they can can um, engage with and identify with the main characters and to feel what they're feeling. Um, I want them to be scared. I want them to be sad. <laughs> um, and I. I want them to understand, you know, something more um, than they knew than they knew before, or they understood before walking into the film. Um, that might be too much to ask, but <laughs> I just hope people leave it um, 
changed, but at the very least, uh, thinking, thinking more. It's not just uh, about entertainment value. It's also about making something that's going to be important, making something that's going to um, cause you to think and cause you to have conversations, similarly to the way I, I guess Anthony would like for his art to speak to the world. Um, so um, I, I, when I'm working with Jordan, I always feel, feel taken care of, and I know that we're trying to do something that's going to be classy, um, that's going to uh, really stand the test of time, and, and that's going to be important to, the, to what's in the zeitgeist right now. I kept Anthony very close to myself. You know, I'm an artist, uh, I'm sensitive, I'm very ambitious, and I know what it's like to want to, to be hot one moment and to kind of cool off and to try to, to try to create another moment, to be looking for something, you know. Um, I also know what it's like to be a newcomer um, in a place and to be searching for inspiration. And so um, I really leaned into those aspects of myself, of what it's like to be, uh, to, to feel displaced and what it's like to be ambitious. and. Uh, and also to allow curiosity to sort of get you in, to get me into a lot of trouble. Uh, you know, when Anthony wanders out into the, in, into Cabrini Green and decides to, to decides to hop the fence and to go after something and to, you know, see what's on the other side of the fence, so to speak. Um, you know, that's very much like my own personality, like my, my own, my own nature. So, um, it's been fun kind of searching into myself and really letting my softer, maybe more sensitive, curious sides play out on on camera, um, I think I think I'm very very similar to to the artist that that Anthony is. Nia was really awesome. I knew from the beginning, from the first time that I sat down with her, and I knew her vision was was just crystal clear for what she wanted to do with the film. She expresses her artistic vision for the piece to the actors and sort of lets the actors mold it. So she's not extremely precious with the work. I'm very interested in terms of like stories about black trauma and how it, uh, how it affects us, how we walk around with it, and how we're trying to seek some sort of, um, I don't know, retribution, some, uh, uh, trying to seek some, some um, I don't know, something to help us continue to walk tall, you know? So I think that he's searching, and Burke is a character that's been waiting, and waiting for his opportunity to, uh, to say you can never forget the names of those that have been killed. So I think in very much so, it's very much uh, indicative of uh, what we are um, saying the names of, you know, uh, Philando Castile, you know, you name it, um, of black men struck down in our community, but community members and leaders, you name it, uh, and how important it is to remember that, to not uh, gloss over it, but you have to remember that in order to move forward. I think Jordan has tapped into something that is so true and honest by going through the lens of genre and going through the lens of horror. In order for us to tell our stories, in order for people to listen, in order for people to, you, to be entertained as well, it's like you gotta give a little spoonful of sugar, you know? You can't just, you know, I think, I think he's the, why it's so popular and why he's, he's uh, so committed to the genre, because I think he finds it's a very uh, significant way to tell our stories that's impactful. When we meet the adult William Burke, uh, you meet him as this uh, sort of kind but strange guy who runs a laundromat on Hudson Street. And he has some secrets to the neighborhood that our main protagonist, uh, Anthony, has a lot of questions uh, surrounding. And uh, Burke begins to provide more and more answers to uh, the legend of Candyman and also how it has permeated Cabrini Green, uh, Cabrini Green projects, and how he's sort of beholding and holding the legacy of all that black trauma. And, uh, and then it, he takes it to another level. And then it evolves, because as uh, Anthony has questions about this myth, and B B uh, Burke provides answers, it turns into something else. I think people like to be terrified. <laughs> I think, um, you know, the boogeyman, that, that thing that we looks over, we're looking over our shoulder for, um, personified in the Candyman, but also the sort of game element of it where you can call it up and see. I think people really are um, enlivened by that. They're really excited.
What I really love about what this film does, the updated Say My Name version of it, is that it really, like the original, um, it talks about so many topical, um, the politic of the day, the politic in terms of gentrification, um, what it means to be an artist, what it means to have a place in the world. Um, you know, Candyman is driven by his need for his story to be told. And so I think all those things resonate with us as an audience. And I think um, it's just a good, good show. So we want to see more of it and see um, what has happened. It feels amazing to be a part of the Candyman legacy. I saw Candyman when I was younger and it was one of those films that I think every kid or at least every little black kid had seen and was like, oh no, you know, your brother tortures, tortures you saying it and leaving you in the bathroom or in the room by yourself to deal with Candyman when he comes, that sort of thing. So. I, I have always been frightened of the Candyman legacy and him coming to get me or something. And to actually, you know, years later, be a part of continuing that story is really cool for me. When we first meet Brianna in the beginning of the film, um, she's this whip smart um, young woman who works in an art gallery and she's really trying to make a name for herself in the art space. Uh, she works for one of these very trendy art spaces that is owned by a white man and you find her using her voice and her knowledge to expand that space to include artists of color. I absolutely adore Nia, our director. Um, she's so smart. I, <laughs> to be able to work with a black woman, a young black woman who knows so much what she wants and has beautiful control over the set and over the way she communicates to the actors and what it is she's wanting and being able to get her visual um, ideas out to those, to the crew and the people she needs to get that to, but also be able to talk character and the things that are important to us as actors has been really, has been really cool. In the same way that with Get Out and Us, what I love that Jordan does is he puts up a mirror to issues we've all already known and we talk about in the black community or in our communities at large. But it's like a fun house mirror, you know, very similar to what happens in us. It's like you're seeing it from a different angle, but then you're seeing it from a, another angle and you can't quite put your finger on what you're witnessing and what they're commenting on. But you're like, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to think about this when I leave the theater. What is really, you know, that I love work that makes you think. I love work that's smart, that really has something to say. And I think, and I know that's what we're doing. Futureprevews.com. Whoa! Go behind the scenes of movies. Subscribe to Future Flicks YouTube channel.